Hi, everybody. This is Joanne with Read Science, and I'm joined, of course, always by my co-host, Jeff Schomeyer, all the way in uh, near DC. And our guest today is Natalie Starkey, who hails from the UK. So we are transatlantic Hi. for the morning. So morning for us, afternoon for over there, right? Yeah, so. it was the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's good. We're glad you could join us and uh, you make time for us and uh, to talk about your book, Catching Stardust, Comets, Asteroids, and the Birth of the Solar System, which is very interesting because we keep sending things into space to go visit asteroids and yeah. comets, and I'm so excited. So um, I'll go ahead and read our um, your bio on the back blurb, if that's okay. So uh, Natalie Starkey is a geologist and cosmochemist following a PhD at Edinburgh University studying the geochemistry of Arctic volcanoes. Natalie's postdoctoral work at the Open University shifted her research focus to comet and asteroid samples. It was at this time she got the chance to analyze samples returned by the NASA Stardust and JAXA Hayabusa space missions. Natalie's passions for her research makes her a keen science communicator. She received a British Science Association Media Fellowship in 2013 and regularly appears on television and radio internationally, as well as being a science host on Neil deGrasse Tyson's popular Star Talk Radio. Um, and then there's you contribute writings here and there, like most of our guests who write books. So Natalie, welcome. We're so happy you're here. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited to chat about my book. This is great. We've got a whole hour. <laughs> I know. Oh, we'll, we'll talk about a lot of things. And Jeff gets to throw out the first question. Yay. And the first question may be a topic, but to start, the, the, I'm sort of after the big picture to, to ease into this, because we're going to be talking about a lot of asteroids, and we're going to be talking about comets, and what they can tell us about the origins of the solar system, which interests everybody. And I was thinking about this and, and finishing the book. And I am I grew up in a time when asteroids were things that stayed in the asteroid belt between the Earth and Mars and may well have been the remnants of a planet that didn't form. And comets were, who knows? Nobody knew what comets were <laughs> or where they came from. <clears throat> and I'm I'm delighted to read your book and to learn so many things that even that I wasn't aware of that have changed and new things we have learned about where they come from, what they are, and why they're such good indicators to tell us about the universe or the origin of the solar system. And I want to work towards some of those, but I feel like we need to organize some facts. So the softball question is, can we establish some general characteristics first of asteroid versus comet? so we can see how they differ, so we can see how we can combine information. To okay, and them. that's that's a great starting point because actually, as you said, we kind of, we've had this idea about what asteroids and comets are for many, many years. And our, you know, our textbooks tell us one thing and actually the science at the moment is really progressing that and, and sort of turning around our ideas of what these objects are. So if we take the classical view, the asteroids were basically formed in the same place as the planets. So they mm -hmm. formed really close to the sun. And so they, they were formed of all the same ingredients that formed the planets. Um, but what happened was that they didn't get kind of gobbled up by these really large planets that were forming they sort of got left out um, and then they congregated together mostly in the asteroid belt sitting between Mars and Jupiter so they contain all the same ingredients that form a planet but they didn't really evolve since then so if you take a large planetary body the thing is because it's so large it generates its own heat and it starts doing very complicated mm -hmm. things and it just evolves over time so the course of that 4.5 billion year history since these objects formed these planets have been through a lot. Now the asteroids haven't really, I, I say haven't really because they have been through some evolution, but mm -hmm. not a whole lot. So they basically stayed the same as when they formed, which means that we can sort of use them to go back and understand where our planets came from. Because if we look at the earth, one of the major problems with Earth, although it's also a really good thing, is that we have plate tectonics. So we are constantly resurfacing our planet. It creates amazing geology and earthquakes and volcanoes, but it means that if we want to go back four and a half billion years to understand where we came from, it's really complex to kind of unpick that geology. So 
that's where the asteroids are really useful. Mm -hmm. Now the comets, um, similarly, they, they're actually older than the asteroids and the planets. They're probably as old as the sun. They formed literally just as the sun was forming, but they formed really, really far away. So we started out with this disk of gas and dust around our young sun. Um, and that was, this, this is basically called the protoplanetary disk. And it formed, it was there before the planets formed. And it was on the outer edge of this disk, really far from the sun, where it was really cold and ices were forming. And this is where we formed the comets we think this is where most of the comets you know in our traditional model this is where they formed so they contain basically all the starting ingredients of a solar system and they've got all the organic matter all the initial gas and dust and they've sort of just preserved it ever since because most of these objects the majority of them have stayed really far away from the sun ever since they formed meaning that they are actually just a little time capsule of that 4.6 billion year history. So this is why they're incredibly useful because we don't have a sample of that period of time without the comets. Now, the problem with them is that most of them are very far away. And I guess that's something we want to explore now because although they, a lot of them live really far away, some of them don't. So we actually get to sample them occasionally. And there's, there's a, a thing that shocked me when I read it that I want to get to in just a minute. But first I want to check, at, at one point when I was thinking about the, uh, the planetary nebula, or I mean the solar nebula at the very beginning, this uh -huh. cloud that's sort of contracting gravitationally, it's conserving angular momentum, it's it's rotating. Am, am I far, far off if I think of it as a giant centrifuge so that heavier things tend to go toward the middle, lighter things tend to go toward the outside, and that's kind of a, kind of a reason why asteroids are all rocky and comets are all icy. So I guess, yes, broadly, we could say very that, broadly. very broadly, but there are some independent processes going on in this mm -hmm. disk because mm -hmm. things are kind of complicated. Things are never as simple in science as we want them to be, but thank goodness, because otherwise mm -hmm. we wouldn't have a job. Um, but yeah, there are some other processes that actually move yeah. some of these objects around that disk. So that's something important yeah. to remember. But on, in general, that would well, be- Well, and so speaking of that, and because you mentioned plate tectonics, we've got earth geology, I don't think I ever knew until I read your book that the solar system in effect has geology, that things have changed. And it would have kept me awake had I not been real sleepy when I read that things are not where they formed in the solar system right now. Yeah. And this whole Jupiter, Saturn resonance is, can we talk about the geology of things moving around? That's That changes the picture, but we still can sort that out, right? Yeah, so, okay, I love talking about geology and space because obviously we always think of geology as being earth-based. And as I started out as a geologist initially, and I was really earth-based. I only, I studied volcanoes on our planet and I didn't really think of our planet as a planet. I just thought of it as earth. And so when you then start studying space, you realize actually the earth is just another planet. Okay, it's a very interesting one. It's a bit different to the others and that it has life and, all the, and lots of plentiful liquid water on its surface, but it's actually no different. And it's, it's no more interesting than any of the other planets. They're all absolutely fascinating in their own right. And they all have a lot to tell us. So I, this way I sort of look at it is like we can look at the other planets and asteroids and comets to tell us about our own history. And we can use our own history to learn about those other objects as well, because they're all made of rock. They're all made of the same things mm -hmm. that that our own planet is made from. So when we go back in history, so we, we formed all of the planets and um, out of this gas of gas, uh, uh, this disk of gas and dust. And we left over bits and bobs. So we like to call them the bits and bobs of the solar system. So this was the asteroids and the comets that got left out of being gobbled up into one of the big planets. Um, and for a while, I guess things were fairly settled um, for a few million years. But then the solar system sort of went a bit crazy and, um, and Jupiter and just decided to do a bit of a movement. Now, the problem is Jupiter is absolutely enormous. So it has a, a massive um, gravity associated with it. So if it decides to move, um, that's not going to be a good thing for the solar system. Now, it plowed through the asteroid belt that had formed at the time um, and it actually started knocking things all over the solar system. So this probably is what created what we see on the moon today all those craters that we see on the moon were probably created about four billion years ago when this happened so asteroids and comets were flung all over the place in fact a lot of them were flung into the inner solar system and probably got gobbled up by the sun but a mm. lot of them equally could have been thrown out of the solar system completely so we had this massive reorganization of, of everything in the solar system and actually planets we think maybe even swapped their positions in the outer solar system um, it's quite interesting that I like to 
to think of some of you know our comets and asteroids now not in our solar system that they're possibly mm -hmm. journeying through interstellar space and i don't know if you remember there's been this isn't in the book because it only happened this year but there's this um asteroid or comet called a muamua which yeah. is um this fascinating object that's wow. been traveling through our solar system that seems like it, it could possibly be a comet from another star system mm -hmm. that would have got ejected out at some point so we start to think well actually the process is happening here and no different to the process is happening around other stars and so we can start to learn about not just our own solar system but other places so you know i think that a muamu object is amazing and i just wish we knew more about it but it literally right. was going so fast through our solar system that we haven't really had a chance to look at it in any detail but I'm sure there's going to be other objects and sure enough you know there could be other civilizations looking at objects from our solar system at the moment you never know i, I love the idea that it's kind of sci-fi but um it's quite exciting to think about <laughs> there are a lot of a lot of facts to marshall and fit together in here but there's a a big idea that i think is really important and i and it sort of underlies all this of how they all fit together to make a coherent big picture which is an answer it's like you know people on the street would say, how does science even know that? You go around yeah. talking about all these things. How do you know that? Because we're just sitting here on Earth and you've got all of these statements about uh, facts, even facts about how the solar system works and how we think it worked four billion years ago and all of these things. And I'm always amazed at how different theories and ideas have to mesh together over big ranges, they really have to fit and new ideas are very highly constrained with what they have to be able to do. And so I was thinking maybe as an example, and all of these things in here are an example, but can we talk about oxygen isotopes, what we can learn from that by looking at comets and things and how that differentiates <laughs> some things and how that locks in with other facts to give us a little piece in a big picture that holds together so solidly. Yeah, definitely. So um, I love what you're saying and I really, I really understand it because actually mm -hmm. when I came into space science, I realized that it's it's such a broad field. You need to have some understanding of a lot of different areas, astronomy, you know, theoretical physics, and I don't have that, but luckily we can collaborate with other scientists yes. who, who have those understandings. So I can look at the rocks mm -hmm. and you know understand the chemistry of them. But And we do have to work together because there's no way that we could understand what went on four and a half billion years ago if we only look at the rocks. Yeah. We have to piece it all together. So that is, you know, incredibly important. Um, so yeah, the oxygen isotopes, they are one major piece of the puzzle of understanding how our solar system formed. So the thing, the great thing about oxygen isotopes is that um, basically you get a different isotope ratio dependent on where the object formed. So if we take any uh, piece of earth rock, um, they'll have different ratios, but they sit on a particular line on a, on a plot we do of looking at mm -hmm. the different oxygen isotopes. If we take a rock from Mars, then equally it's going to sit on a different line on that plot. So we know that it's a it's not from Earth. Um, the only way we have rocks from Mars, of course, is from meteorites because we've never actually directly collected samples from Mars. Um, mm -hmm. Again, the moon, um, probably a bad example. It's basically almost the same as, as the Earth, but that's because actually that tells us a lot about how it formed. Mm -hmm. It formed from the Earth. So, yeah. so there's been a lot of back and forth whether it is different or not, but it seems at the moment it's probably the same, basically the same composition. But if you, so, Basically, wherever these objects formed, um, they have a different oxygen isotope ratio. So if we take the comets, we can, or the or the asteroids, we can start to tell if it is a comet or asteroid just by looking at its oxygen isotopes. So, but then different asteroids have different oxygen isotope ratios because they formed in slightly different places. So we can tell an awful lot about where they formed in relation to the planets from just studying them in this way. So a lot of this comes from meteorite samples. Mm -hmm. But we also have space missions, very few space missions now that have brought back some of these materials to Earth. So we sort of have, I, I don't really want to call it the ground truth because it's sort of an overused term, yeah. but we sort of have that ground truth of, of what yeah. that particular object in space looks like. And then we can compare it to all the meteorites we have on Earth. And we have a lot of them. But um, you have, I'm sorry, you have already a couple of hidden, hidden connections in the explanations you just gave, which is how do we know now that the moon was formed from the earth material and also even how do we know that some of these bits of meteorites came from mars yeah it's i mean because they it's fit a really together good question. so 
there's a lot of different lines of evidence actually and it's not just the oxygen ice mm -hmm. we have to look so that was one line of evidence and we were pretty convinced but we didn't know for sure it's from mars so then we need the space missions so data sent back from these space missions has, has measured um you know the atmosphere of mars so actually we can crack these rocks apart and within them they contain a little sample of mars's atmosphere mm -hmm. that they captured when that rock formed so we can measure that on earth and we can basically crack the rock open, measure that Martian atmosphere, and we can measure it on the surface of Mars and compare those two measurements. Of course, they're taken by different instruments, and we have to be careful that we're measuring like with like. But what we can see from this is that we have broadly the same ratio of the gases and we have broadly the same abundances. So we actually know that's another line of evidence to say, OK, this mm -hmm. rock definitely looks Martian. Um, and so that kind of helps and, us along, along the way. And then it's it's a good line on how science actually gets but done by real scientists because at some point somebody said you know i wonder if this might not be from mars this piece of rock because mm -hmm. there was an idea over here and somebody else says you know what if it is then we probably could find some mm, trace evidence of its atmosphere inside let's look they look and they go ha i was right yeah and <laughs> there's some more pieces that slot in a little bit and strengthens the whole the whole structure right Exactly. Now, the problem comes when we want to look at the asteroids and the comets, the comets mm. in particular, because one yeah. of the problems with them is that because they're made of ice and they're kind of they're fragile. So the way I like to describe them is almost like you take a scoop of freshly powdered snow and you add some dirt in it and you sort of pack it together a little bit, but you don't pack it together very well. So it'd be a really bad snowball. Um, <laughs> and, and I think a lot of them are sort of this structure when they form. So they're exceptionally fragile. So if you imagine that object, um, coming into the atmosphere, um, it, you know, a lot of the time these objects break up in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And if we compare that to an asteroid, well, a lot of the asteroids have a lot of metal in them. So they're very strong. They're very, you know, their, their cohesion is very good and they have a lot of rock. So as they come through the atmosphere, they tend generally to survive that or they'll break up mm -hmm. into bigger pieces of rock. So that means on the planet, in terms of the meteorite record, we have a lot of asteroids, but we don't necessarily have a lot of comets unless there are comets out there that maybe don't look like these snowball, these dirty snowballs that mm -hmm. classically we think they should look like. So the problem comes that what do the comets look like? How do we get samples of comets? Because it's complex. They're icy materials. They're not easy to sample and, and analyze. You know, if you bring a bit of ice back to the planet, even if you went to sample it from a comet, well, it's you've got to store that ice somehow and maintain it, which is tricky. But the, mm -hmm. the dusty parts of the comets are easy enough to analyze. And we've done that quite a lot. And so the oxygen isotopes that we measure on bits of comet um, actually tell us an awful lot about where they formed. And we get a massive, so a lot of my um, postdoc research was looking at this, and we just get this massive range of oxygen isotope ratios, which short, sort of show us that these objects formed all over the place. They didn't just form in, in one location. Yeah. And that sort of relates now to where, they, where they're living now. They, they live in the Kuiper Belt, which is right at the edge of the solar system. And then they live even further out than that in like this theoretical cloud around the solar system, the mm -hmm. Oort cloud. Right. Um, and I think, you know, their formation is over a huge distance from the sun. Um, and their compositions today, when we analyze them, reflect, you know, that that formation environment, that it's a very complex area we that we still don't understand in any detail, really. So, so yeah, speaking of comets and, and asteroids, now I could see the choice of a comet to try and go out and, and study, maybe that's just a proximity thing. Right, we're we're gonna we're gonna try and study a comet the best we can as it approaches the Earth, right? Yeah. And then asteroids. I I was sitting there going, I have no idea how they chose that asteroid. To, so to yeah, a lot Why of that it. one. There are so many and. Yeah, completely. A lot of it is luck, actually. Um, so, OK, so the asteroids tend to live in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. The comets, on the other hand, live in the Kuiper belt or the Oort cloud in general. But the thing is, they sometimes get knocked out of these kind of stable orbits and they end up coming towards the sun. So there's a lot of these objects that are orbiting on their own little orbit and they they go back out to the asteroid belt and back out to the Kuiper belt. But they come in via the inner planets quite a lot, so via Earth. Um, and these are sort of called the near-Earth asteroids. And we're tracking all of these objects. And NASA are doing a great job, and a lot of other space agencies, of tracking these objects, working out exactly where they're going to be at any point in the future, and working out how close they're going to pass to Earth. So it looks like, at the moment, none are going to collide with us for at least 100 years. So this is a good thing. We think we're safer now. But when they come towards the Earth, it gives us a great opportunity to go and study them. Because obviously, the closer they are, we can study them with 
ground-based telescopes more easily because they're easier to see but we can also send a spacecraft up there to actually go and, and look at them in detail even sample them which is what we're trying to do at the moment now the first mission to do this in detail was the NASA Stardust mission. Um, and the next one was the uh, European Rosetta mission. And that had this incredible journey. You think, okay, well, this comet was coming towards the sun. It was relatively close to us, but it took 10 years for this spacecraft after it launched to actually catch up with this comet in space. It, you know, it had to go on awkward flybys of Earth and Mars to gain gravitational energy to get onto the same orbit and get at the right speed to actually kind of approach the comet from behind and catch up with it to then go into orbit around it and start studying it. It was actually this mission meant to go to a different comet to start with, oh. but there was an issue with the, um, the rocket launch um, and, and there were some problems, I think, with the previous launch before the one the Rosetta was meant to go. And so the launch was delayed and so they had a different target initially and they had to change it. So there are other objects they can go to but they had to quickly think about okay which one's going to be in the right place and can we get to it and quickly do some rocket science and figure out what they were going to do so it's absolutely fascinating that they can do that and i wish i understood yeah. that, that phase and, of it, and but. even that there to think about it and propose for funding and all of that takes several more years mm -hmm. you know they have to already be thinking about where would we like to go and this is what we want to do yeah yeah it's 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 mind boggling to me that so it was actually 10 years previous to that that they yeah. had the initial uh, proposals in so you've got to start to think of it that look, scientists only usually when they're more senior in their careers would start to um, suggest missions and stuff because that's when they have the you know they, they have the following that they might be believed yeah. that they could do this and the problem is when you've got such a long mission is that by the time it gets to its object, well, mm -hmm. these people are retired or, you know, some of them have actually even died. It was really sad that some of mm -hmm. them were no longer with us when we actually got to the comet. But this is why, you know, I got the chance to be involved because actually I came in. I, I was, I don't think I'd even done my degree when they were first thinking about this mission. And then I come along as a very junior scientist and I get to work on this fascinating mission because obviously they need younger people to come in and, and do some science because we're still going to be doing science from these missions for you know the following few decades so it's just part of that I, I kind of like that thing about about space science it's sort of slow but then it, it's so collaborative and it involves so many people so people have a lot of connection to these missions because so many scientists have worked on it over the years and we've all got our own little piece of it and I kind of like that so I you know here's something uh, like I'm a cell biologist and <laughs> molecular biology techniques change so rapidly you know, and we can do amazing things with new things and new machines. Now, is the change slower for this geochemical kind of study? You know, because I'm thinking, wow, if someone said we're sending, we want to study cells in space, they won't be there. But you know what I mean? Like 20 years would be very different equipment, very different. You know what I mean? Do, yeah. Sometimes wish you could be more instantaneous and send the latest, mm -hmm. greatest, smallest, piece of equipment that you could. I mean, I, I'm, I, I really, I don't know. So there's sort of, I guess there's two parts to this answer. And the first yeah. is that when we send equipment into space, we actually tend to send kind of old equipment mm -hmm. because we need dependable technology. We don't want to send the newest, you know, technically brilliant piece of equipment because we can't be sure that it's going to work. We want something simple that we can depend on and that it's not going to break. And so that, because if you've spent 10 years to get to a comet, <laughs> The last thing you want is something to go wrong and, and there's rich literally nothing you can do once you're there you know if something breaks unless you can upload some new code or you know get it to reboot itself and fix it if it's a mechanical problem there's really nothing you can do um so that is one of the issues of sending stuff into space and that's why as a, i like sample return missions because the idea is that if we go into space and send our symbol technology and collect a sample and mm -hmm. bring it back to earth there's two parts to that. We have it on Earth for forever. And, you know, if we've got enough sample and we're careful with it, um, scientists can be studying it for years to come, um, which means that we can develop our ideas over decades. But also technology, as you said, improves. So our scientific instruments on, on the Earth are, in, you know, incredibly complex and they improve all the time and we're always working on them. And actually some instruments are designed specifically for certain missions. In fact, there was a mission to the sun called the Genesis mission, a NASA one, and they had to design Design an instrument just to analyze those samples of because of the way they had to collect them they didn't have anything at the time that could analyze them so they had to build a whole massive instrument to actually just do those measurements and they measure the composition of the Sun which is amazing so 
Sample return is really important for that reason, that we can then bring back the samples. And as you said, with any type of science, it's, you know, our instruments are progressing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's the beauty of it. We can reanalyze samples. The Apollo samples were analyzed, you know, back in the 1970s, and then we can analyze, we're still analyzing them now with our new instruments and improving those measurements and coming up with new theories mm -hmm. uh, about them. We still have a lot of Apollo sample rocks. So, you know, it's going to be going on for, for probably much longer than decades. <laughs> so, yeah. Those are really good points, I think, about about the sample return idea and yep. and other just so many ideas. And yeah, Joanne. Um, so I did a I did a uh, one of the things I've done is is a uh, space shuttle mission, and you it takes so long to plan things, and you, you know computer equipment changes, things change every year, but you have to decide seven years ahead of launch what it's going to be. So. When we launched our first uh, mission in 1994, we were very advanced for having a 68,000 processor in our computer because that was like standard <laughs> time and that was a huge risk. But Natalie, your point about, about being able to reanalyze is good because the mm -hmm. instruments do change and that technology advances, but also if you have to send the instrument, you made this point in the book, you have to send the instrument, the spacecraft is only 20 pounds maybe 50 pounds 100 pounds it you cannot send a, a room-sized uh, mass spectrometer uh, uh the state of the art to do this this equipment so you have to be very clever but sometimes space people doing experiments in space are exceedingly clever <laughs> and one one thing i remember was um uh, from your book was the uh the mission to the comet with the lander mm -hmm. and the rosetta is this rosetta the rosetta delay? thank you it's like you know i'm old enough i forget <laughs> and the way that they the, the scientists are saying we wonder whether the asteroid with the numbers and slashes and things name <laughs> <laughs> whether it is um differentiated whether it's rocky whether it's uniform density and so some clever gravitational orbital dynamics person came up with an answer. So I was amazed at how they improvised a way to determine the answer to that, if you would reveal that for us. Yeah, so um, no, you're right. And so this is one of the things about going to these objects in space. We know very little about them before we get there. So again, about sending these instruments up, um, not only do we want them to be simple, but we need them to actually deal with different environments that we don't understand before we get there. So part of the thing about the Rosetta Comet, which is called 67P Churyumov Gerasimenko, yes. um, <laughs> just about got that down. Um, it, we didn't really even know much about its shape. We knew roughly what its size was, but when we actually approached the comet, we started to learn about its shape. We thought it was sort of a potato shape, but when we got there, it turned out to be, well, it was described as like a rubber ducky. It was like a head and this body, um, which was a really fun shape. And actually the media picked up on it and it was really fun. Um, but obviously if you were planning to orbit around a circular object, it's very different to orbiting around something with a complicated shape. So that involves some quick thinking and some, some careful mathematics to try and figure out how they were going to orbit around this object but equally they didn't know what the surface of it looked like and whether it was hard or whether it was soft and um, so they had to design a lander that was capable of landing on anything really from you know fluffy snow to something as hard as concrete um, and so they had to this little lander had to be capable of not bouncing off the surface but also you know not sinking into it so I just can't believe that they actually managed it of course the landing didn't go quite to plan and they did have a little bounce across the surface um, but they eventually came to rest and they did science along the way so it wasn't a failure by any means but they didn't mm -hmm. you know achieve their first landing although i love that the scientists turn this around and go well we just achieved the first three landings on a yes. comet ever so <laughs> <laughs> um but obviously once they're on the comet they were able to do a lot of science because we because we can do things on there and um, that you can't then do when you're just orbiting around an object so what we had at this stage was a lander sitting on the comet and we had an orbiter still in space um orbiting around the comet now the comet was small so it doesn't have a lot of gravity so actually when we say it was orbiting it actually was do, having to do powered flight around the comet the whole time mm -hmm. because it sort of it wasn't being naturally attracted to it and because of its awkward shape it didn't want to crash into the thing so what we had now now is that we could 
basically get these two instruments to talk to each other um, and they were able to beam back information to Earth to tell us about the structure of that comet. So basically, if you've got a lander sitting on one point of the comet and the orbiter going around, they're talking to each other and you can start to see how um, what the structure is of that material in between those two objects. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, dependent and also that's one way to do it, but also dependent on how much that little orbiter was attracted towards that comet and, and not attracted as it went around. So basically that small change in gravity that was created by that massive comet as that orbiter went around. Um, it, it, we could detect that on Earth um, by looking at the radar signals coming back. And we could start to see what the structure was inside that comet. So we'd already learned that it was a very light comet. So it, it's kind of, it was a bit confusing because we learned the density of the comet was less than that of ice and it is less than that of dust and yet we think it's formed of ice and dust so we had to find a way of explaining why it was less dense than both those things it should contain so the theory was that it either had big gaping holes in the middle or it had very small holes like a sponge that it was almost very porous um, and doing this experiment was the only way to figure out whether it had these big kind of caves within it or whether it had the very small holes and what we found is as the orbit went around the comet it, its um, gravitational attraction towards the comet was not altered a huge amount so what they could conclude from that is that actually the comet has these very tiny pore spaces within it, which sort of goes back to that formation, that traditional model of how it formed, that it's sort of a scoop of this um, snowball of this of this cloud that originally formed from, and you sort of packed it together, but not very well, and it, it ends up with all these little, little holes within it. Um, so we're learning from that, that simple experiment, we've learned so much about the structure of that comet and probably about the other comets that exist out there. They're, I, I would expect them to all be very similar to that, um, but who knows? If I, no, if, I pause, yeah, if I pause and stop being an, an all-knowing scientist for a while, isn't that just amazing? It is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Well, I was thinking my favorite thing, and, and I knew about this before I read your book, but I appreciated the this, the, the discussion and the description mm -hmm. of this, like this tennis racket size thing that has the aerogel and just can uh -huh. scoop up <laughs> particles. I'm like, this is so clever. That is, yeah, so that was the NASA Stardust mission, which preceded yes. Rosetta. Um, yes. And that's the first uh, comet sample return mission that, you know, we've ever done. And it was a relatively cheap mission, actually. And they would have loved to have landed on the comet and brought back some sample that way. But that's incredibly expensive. It's almost two missions in one because you've got to get there, you've got to land, you've got to launch back to Earth again. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways they thought to get around this is like, well, we'll just fly through the tail of it. So as a comet goes via the sun, it gets heated up, on, you know, understandably. And all that ice and stuff it contains gets heated up and starts to stream off the back of the comet and take with it pieces of those dust particles that that, that comet contains. So the idea with Stardust was like, OK, we'll just flip up this little tennis racket collector from the spacecraft, fly through this tail, and we're going to collect these impacting particles at six kilometers per second, which is incredibly fast. It's faster than the speeding bullet. Um, and we're going to capture them perfectly and bring them back to Earth and we can analyze them. And sure <laughs> enough, they managed not to destroy them in the process and they managed to bring back pieces of rock back to Earth for us to analyze. So that was some of the first samples I worked on, which is probably why I'm now so excited about comets and asteroids because I've just had that chance to analyze those samples and, and I just absolutely loved working on them. They were tiny, which meant they were very mm -hmm. challenging to work with. Mm -hmm. Um, because you're only going to collect dust-sized particles using that method. Um, but we learned an awful lot about comets from that mission. It was really groundbreaking for many reasons, but scientifically, we learned so much from it. Remind and us the, how, uh, how small tiny is. Yeah, All right, go so, ahead. Yeah, exactly. so I guess some of the particles were slightly larger, but, um, but they would tend to be single grains of something which um, were very hard. So this was the thing we weren't actually expecting to collect those grains so we're talking maybe 30 microns big as maybe up to 100 microns but mm -hmm. so the width of a human hair roughly um but a lot of them were a lot smaller now the thing was we weren't expecting to collect big hard particles like that because we didn't expect comets to contain those so these big hard particles that survive these impacts um looked very much like the stuff that we found in comets, uh, in, in asteroids, sorry, in, in the meteorite samples. And this is why the Stardust mission was so groundbreaking, because suddenly in this comet, which we knew was a comet, it was called VILT-2, um, it, it contained particles that 
were from the asteroids. So yeah. you mentioned the theory earlier about, you know, all the heavy stuff and all the hot stuff forming in the inner solar system. Well, we had a bit of a problem now because these comets, which were in the mm -hmm. outer solar system and definitely should have formed out there, um, contain some of these materials from the hot inner solar system. Um, and that completely threw open our ideas on how these objects formed because somehow we had to find a way and we still haven't got an answer for this of how we move material from the very inner solar system all the way out to the outer solar system where the comets form within an incredibly short time scale because these objects formed within the first few million years of the solar mm -hmm. system evolution. Um, and so there could have been big jets of winds taking these particles out, but actually there's some problems with that because we haven't yet modeled whether these jets could maybe pick up particles of this size range that may be too big and too heavy. So somehow we have to find a way to get them out there. There's some other theories that maybe there were hot areas in the outer solar system um, that could have formed mm. these grains. And um, that's another theory that we could think about. But, you know, it's finding the evidence for these theories. We can talk about them, but yeah, we need to study more of these objects to really understand, you know, does one comet to another have a different amount of these grains in them? Or is it that this is a weird comet and it's the only one like it or whatever? You know, we've got so much to investigate still because we've really just sampled so few comets and asteroids at the moment that was sort of building up the picture still. So in Japan has Hayabusa, or I think two of them, right? Is this yeah. Right? Yeah, and, and, and they're a, supposed to be a sample return mission, right? Yeah, so we had Hayabusa 1, um, which um, was a sample return mission from an asteroid, and it was successful, but it, it had some issues. So it went to collect sample in like a, a grab-and-go kind of sample mm -hmm. collection. Um, it went slightly wrong. Uh, so they collected material, but very, very small particles, um, which was okay for people like me who work on very, very small particles, but we were hoping for some <laughs> large material. So they've gone back with Hayabusa 2, which is an updated, it's a very similar mission but it's updated and it's got a lot more stuff with it they've got little landers and ro basically rovers that can go on the surface and they've sent back pictures from the surface and that's amazing and um, but they're going to be bringing about hopefully a lot more sample having learned from that first mission it's kind of like the Apollo era kind of progressing gradually we make some mistakes but hopefully we don't make big mistakes and then we learn from those and we can improve each mission so that's one of the missions high booster 2 which I mean it's it's at its asteroid at the moment called okay. I think it's pronounced really Yugu. Um, probably in Japanese it might sound a bit different, but um, it's an interesting asteroid and we should have samples back within like, the, next, within the next decade. So that's going to be amazing to learn about that one. Yeah, I heard, uh, I think I saw recently a story where it sort of landed and went back up. It was like a practice land and went back up and yeah, we'll land again or something yeah so they've yeah. got various landers that they're sending down so that's um so we're just getting different bits of information back from it because basically they need to find somewhere to sample that isn't got hasn't got like big boulders because obviously we need right. somewhere there where we can actually pick up some materials so a lot of the missions to to these objects again because we don't know what they look like before we get there in any detail anyway it, we've got to map the surface of them with you know just literally take photos to understand what we're seeing and understand where we would want to sample and that was a big thing with the Rosetta mission they spent months mapping um, that comet just to understand where they were going to put that lander down because you don't want to send your precious little lander into a boulder stream field where it's going to fall over and not be able to land safely equally you don't want to send it somewhere boring because if it's just boring and flat and yeah. the geology is not very interesting then you know people like me are going to be upset because we don't get interesting samples so it's always a playoff between you know the people who you know the engineers who want a safe landing and the geologists <laughs> who want an interesting area to land so <laughs> so, so uh, talking about picking things up and bringing them back to earth you had a, an extensive discussion on asteroid mining uh, yes. feasibility why and how and all that so yeah let, let's talk about well, it's that it's such a fascinating topic and i really wanted to have a chapter on it in my book because although a chapter really doesn't do it a service it's like there's such a big topic and it's so fast moving at the moment but mm -hmm. i wanted to get something in there to to talk about it because it seems like science fiction and we've sort of seen the movies like armageddon i know that's a movie about an asteroid coming to hit the earth but what they do is actually send up oil drillers to to this asteroid to try and mm -hmm. drill into it and destroy it before it you know with nuclear weapons 
distance before it hits the earth. And the idea is that they've set these big, you know, vehicles up there, they're strolling around on the surface of this asteroid and they make it look like you could just mine it like you could on earth. Now, in reality, as we've said, like these objects don't have a lot of gravity associated with them. So we're almost certainly not gonna have humans roaming around on them and drilling into them because they would just float off into space. So the problems of mining these objects are different to what we'd have on earth, but it doesn't make them necessarily harder to mine. We just have to think completely differently. Um, now, one of the things about asteroids is that they can contain a huge amount of precious metals. So it's sort of like if you took all, um, basically on Earth, the precious metals are, are concentrated in small areas um, and we have to mine kind of, well, it's small areas, but we have to mine a lot of material in order to get the precious metals we need. Now, the idea is that one asteroid in space, even a moderately sized asteroid of about a kilometre in size, um, could be worth more in terms of something like platinum than, than we've actually mined on our planet in the whole of time. So there's the potential that we could gain a lot from these objects. Now, the economics of the situation is that if we were to go up and mine one of these objects and bring back all this platinum, well, we're gonna flood the market and we're gonna have issues, you know, we don't need that much platinum then. Um, but that obviously, I'm not an economist, and I, I don't need to get involved in that. But um, <laughs> the idea is that one of the things we could do with this is not bring it back to earth and actually use these metals to further explore into space. Um, it sounds again like science fiction and it kind of is at the moment, but if we want to progress and go to Mars and go even further into space, we need to find a way to do it sustainably. We can't take everything from our planet all the time, particularly water. Now we know that comets contain a lot of water, we need water in space. If we're gonna take humans, we definitely need water. It can be used as a radiation shield in space. It has so many properties and it can even be used as fuel. If we want to create fuel in space, we can potentially split the water into hydrogen and oxygen and it could be useful. So it could be that we could go up and just collect a comet or asteroid in space and, and start mining it. Or basically if you had a comet, you might be able to just melt it down in a bag effectively and collect those, <laughs> those volatile materials and use them in some way in space to, you know, progress out further um, it would just be a lot cheaper than having to send everything from the earth because it's so expensive to launch mm -hmm. heavy materials off our planet um, humans are bad enough but trying to take water and things like that is even harder so it seems like there's not a lot happening at the moment there's a lot of companies involved in this space mining industry um, and there's a lot of money involved you've got these you know billionaires who are investing in these companies and it seems kind of crazy at the moment but you know the US passed a law on who could own what in space and basically a US citizen if they go into space and want to mine an object they're now allowed to own whatever they mine um, and I think they're the first country and I think so far the only country to have passed a law like that it doesn't seem fair that they can just do that and all the other countries are a bit behind like I'm not a US citizen so what if I wanted to go up into space and mine I, I can't own those materials so there's a lot of international law involved. Mm -hmm. We sort of need to have a think about how this is gonna work. Luxembourg as another country, a tiny country, but behind mm -hmm. this, this idea at the moment of going up and doing space mining. Um, and we're at the stage where we just need to figure out how we're gonna do it cheaply. We need to figure out how we're gonna launch a lot of different rockets into space to uh, and, and do it often because that's what we're going to require. We're going to need to go up there and prospect. So we're going to need to go and observe these objects, understand what they're made of, basically similar to the missions that we've already been doing, but in terms of doing it to make money. Um, and then we're going to need to work out how we would go up and mine them if, they, if we think they're going to be worth a lot of money. So sorry, it's a really long answer, but um, sure, it's such wow. a big topic. <laughs> Just yeah, I think it's not easy, is it? It's not an easy thing to do. It's not, but I do think, um, I mean, it's going to cost trillions of dollars to even get to the point of being able to mine an object in space. But it's possible that, you know, any object could be worth more than mm -hmm. that um, in, mm -hmm. in its resources, even if you just mined one reasonably sized object. There are a lot of issues. They are talking about maybe dragging these things, like capturing them and dragging them into a different orbit, maybe near the moon, a safe orbit where they can sort of sit and then think about what to do with it and maybe launch missions from the moon to go in and, you know, look at them. I think there'll be some payoff for science because if they're going to these objects and bringing back materials, they'll need them characterized. They'll need scientists to go, mm -hmm. oh, what's actually in this? And so, you know, hopefully we would gain some free samples in the process. But it seems like it's it's just getting started at the moment. And I do honestly believe it's going to happen. I just don't know what the outcome will be. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, who who's going to make the money and, and who's going to suffer? And I, I feel like international law will eventually catch up, but hopefully not too late. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we don't have any problems. 
shootout solar in space solar or system law. Yeah. <laughs> More than international law, we need interplanetary space law. law. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but the payoff, the payoff could be really, 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 really huge. Yeah. It could. Like, and that I, I wrote that down, and happily you mentioned it, but the fact that we say, oh, suppose this uh, modestly sized asteroid only has 50 parts per million of platinum it still could have more platinum than we've ever mined on Earth. That's yeah. one asteroid out of, what was it, the 70,000, 700,000 that we know already now? Yes, well, that's the ones that we've mapped in our, yeah. you know, with our yeah. report. Um, space, so. this is where we pause and say, space is really, really big and there's a it's lot crazy. in it, right? So, and how, I'm sorry, I was just thinking too, since we need to do some biology, we've, <laughs> we've known for, for some time now, I think that uh, that there are uh, organic molecules in space, and in particular on asteroids, and in particular amino acids. And so the 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 easy question is here: How did we come to know that, and what are the implications? So yeah, it's always fascinated me that we found amino acids in space. Um, and I think a lot of people maybe aren't aware of that. Um, when I mention it to people, they're kind of like, oh, what, what does that mean? I'm like, well, yeah. it's interesting. We don't really know what it means. Like, do, did we come from outer space? Well, yeah, we formed from the sun. And so of course we're from outer space. But the question is how did life get to our planet? Was it here from the beginning, from when the, the earth formed from that disk of gas and dust? Or was it that it wasn't here and then it was brought in later from outer space? So mm. the thing about the amino acids is that there was a really interesting meteorite that landed, I think it was in the late 60s, um, and it's called Murchison, and it's packed full of organic matter. So um, it you know, contains a lot of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. So this is basically an organic rich meteorite, um, which comes from an organic rich asteroid out there, um, which is not dissimilar to some of the comets, in fact. So they're also very organic rich. Mm. Um, they started analyzing this meteorite. I mean, it's been analyzed to death, but it's still, <laughs> they're still learning so much from it. It's got an incredible amount of amino acids in it. Um, and I think there's there's more been found in that um, asteroid than, uh, sorry, in that meteorite than we've got on Earth at the moment too, for all the biology on Earth. So that's kind of interesting that there's more variation <laughs> out there in space. Mm -hmm. um, we'd never found any of these amino acids in comets until we went and sampled them in space because obviously we weren't sure if we had samples on Earth or we didn't have any really big enough samples, mm -hmm. that's for sure to be able to do the analysis. So um, the Stardust mission, some of the samples it brought back with the tennis racket collector, um, they found glycine, which is one of the simplest amino acids mm. in those samples. But there was always some doubt over whether that was actually a contamination issue because you know of how the samples were collected and it was complicated to get them out of this aerogel collector. But then we actually also detected glycine with the Rosetta mission on the side of the comet. So they have the, that's that same thing on, on there. So there's probably other amino acids on these comets but um, it's really hard for us to actually measure them because we haven't got the right samples. We need a big sample we, and we need it on Earth so that we can actually analyze it in real detail. Um, but the fact is they do contain these amino acids and the asteroids and the comets do. Um, so we're sort of then going, okay, so did these objects deliver these amino acids to Earth and how will we start to pick apart that problem? So we need to start looking at the corality of these, of the, of these amino acids and understand if they're the same as the amino acids we have on Earth. And, and then it gets a bit more complicated. And that's sort of where we're at at the moment. We're sort of needing to analyze more objects to really understand whether we've got the same type of amino acids as we have mm -hmm. on Earth. And it does look like we do, and it do, but we haven't been able to do that for um, the comets yet. We've only done it for the, the asteroid samples. Um, so, okay, that's great. Say they look like they could be the same. Um, but we don't know whether that's real. We don't know whether that's something that happened. So it's hard to explain. So I don't know if that's something that happened on Earth. So we've got all this type, certain type of amino acids, and it was something that happened after these amino acids start formed on Earth. And whether that same thing just happened in space, there was another mechanism for it, or whether they just are related and that we are just all from the same thing. But already it feels like uh, a different perspective from uh, my youth again of, we think this process may have accidentally one time in a billion have created some amino acids which we get excited about because those are the building blocks of life that perspective versus you know we look into space and everywhere we look in you know interstellar space even we see signs of amino acids and carbon compounds and that we get these asteroids filled with stuff and that's that's 
quite a, a, a different viewpoint from this exceedingly rare event to maybe that's not what happened, but this stuff is all over the place. It's very different and it really broadens, you know, our search for life elsewhere because it doesn't make it a unique event. It means that actually life could be on other planets or it could have been on other planets. Um, and there's no real reason to expect it not to be because mm -hmm. we sort of see these basic building building blocks everywhere and then all we need is really the right environment for them to to flourish um you know they need to be delivered at the right time to a planet or have been there at the right time when there was almost certainly we think we need liquid water or some kind of other solvent but water seems the most useful one because we need that for the biological processes to actually happen we don't want a planet that's too hot or too cold we're testing extremophiles in space at the moment these are these right. um organisms that can survive under extreme pressures or temperatures and we have some of them on earth that you know some of these things that live at the bottom of the oceans under extreme pressure places we don't think biology should be able to function but it actually can it so when we go into space and we look at these weird planets that have you know extreme radiation is probably the biggest issue but if we've got extreme pressures and temperatures it doesn't mean that life can't survive we just don't expect it to be able to because we don't mm. expect to find it there so that's sort of where we're at and it's a whole field of astrobiology which is fascinating it's yeah. linking the space and the geology and the biology all together to try and figure out if we've got environments where life could have flourished or could have in the yeah. past well then, from both of you, maybe can we recap why we get excited about finding amino acids? What what's exciting about amino acids? Oh, for me. Well, for you, but no, for the bigger <laughs> thing, it's like remember, I'm a I'm the physical scientist. It's like okay. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. People go on and on about amino acids, so there are <laughs> amino acids everywhere. Why do we get excited? Because there are amino acids everywhere. We should probably ask the, um, the cell biologist. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we get excited because these are the building blocks of protein and everything, you know, is at every organism has protein as well as lipids and sugars. But yeah, we, we can't do anything. And DNA, of course, produces, uh, you know, DNA is the sequence that then uh, when it is read, we create strings of amino acids to make proteins. So if there's amino acids, there might be something somewhere that's like figuring out how to string them together. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's- Well, it, and there was a lot of work uh, in my fabled youth now of people trying to figure out how in the world some of these amino acids might have been synthesized in these rare events. And so it doesn't necessarily tell us, well, where life comes from if you wanna go all the way from the hydrogen with a little bit of helium origin of the universe but saying, oh, look, there are amino acids everywhere. It gets us a lot closer to something living without, yeah, without think, a lot of work, right? I think the problem is it's it's still a big step to go from just having amino acids to having mm -hmm. you know complex life forms. And I think that's the step at the moment which we don't understand. We've got to understand how they got here, whether they were here from the beginning or not. Okay. Um, just the fact we have them on every object in space that we've looked at so far um, doesn't tell us an awful lot. We still need to understand why Earth has seemingly got all this lovely life and we are the only place that we know of to have it. Now, I don't believe we are the only place. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if we've got life in our solar system. I think there's a small chance it could be somewhere else in our solar system, but I honestly believe there is life out there elsewhere because I just don't think it's going to be a unique event um, when you look but, at all the stars that are out there. And that I knowing think that there are these out. amino acids everywhere gives a lot of us the feelings like, well, there are amino acids everywhere. It's going to be really hard not to have life someplace. So. I, I just based on statistics of you know how many stars are literally sitting out there and the fact yeah. that interstellar space that eventually you know from from which everything forms contains the organic matter it contains everything you need um, mm -hmm. to create earth so it contains everything you need to do that again um, mm -hmm. and you know sure enough some of these events are probably very random but I feel like there's every chance it could have happened elsewhere, um, which I think is so exciting. I don't think in our lifetimes we're ever going to know, um, but wouldn't it be amazing if we could find that out? Yeah, definitely. I agree. And I sort of with you on that, like if, you know, if we've got these random occurrences of, yeah, hydrogen and um, carbon and oxygen coming together to create amino acids and they're probably creating sugars and they're probably creating mm -hmm. lipids and, well, it doesn't take that long till, you know, I don't know the exact mechanism, but it would seem at some point you've created some sort of organism. Yeah. 
So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's amazing. So I, I want to ask in the last few minutes, so you do a lot of science outreach, mm -hmm. um, as I read in your bio. And so how did you, you know, sort of uh, move from uh, research to outreach and to even then writing a book and, yeah. Yeah, it's been yeah quite an interesting process. I've always really enjoyed talking to people about the science I do. Um, and that started out just going into schools and talking to school kids. And then actually it was um, the BBC in the UK, they ran this course to um, increase the number of females, well, female experts in various subjects on in the media and on being interviewed on television as experts, because there's a big problem, obviously, that we're just not visible. And so we're worried that this is one of the issues that is preventing girls from entering STEM subjects. So they did this course and they basically just taught us how to be interviewed on television. I and mean, it was so exciting and so much fun because we went to the studios and met a lot of the presenters and it was a really good day. But then we were on these lists for the media to kind of go on and on Sky News or BBC and, and being interviewed about certain subjects and it just so happened that was the same year that Rosetta um, got to oh. its comet so I was then on the list and it was just kind of luck <laughs> that, um, that I was involved in the mission at, at the right time and I really loved talking about science on TV it was just really fun so that sort of progressed from there and then I'd been interested in writing I've always loved writing but um, I would always thought I was going to write a novel when I was younger but I'd never had the idea so um, so yeah, I then had the idea that I could possibly write a book about space and the stuff that I love doing at the moment. So it sort of just came organically and then I moved country with my husband and so I had the opportunity, I sadly leaving behind my research, but I had the opportunity then to write my book, which has just been such a fun process and and hence why I started writing a second book because I really enjoyed doing it. So <laughs> right. I want to do it all again for some mad reason. <laughs> so, so are we uh, allowed to know what your next book is about? So the next one is um, focused on space again, but I'm going back to my roots of volcanoes. So my uh -huh. PhD was on volcan volcanic research. Um, so it's basically space volcanoes. It's called fire and ice, um, because actually in space, we have some volcanoes that look like those on Earth, so that are made of hot rock and you know magma, but we have a lot of volcanoes that are made of ice. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of put this two together and, and kind of bring together how we think all these different things form, because it may not look like a volcano, but actually it is but it's made mm -hmm. of methane or or some crazy <laughs> different form of ice um but the mechanisms are the same and it's exploring how the different planetary bodies have been active over their lifetimes and um, some of them are still active today some are now dead and so what i want to explore is like why that's happened so it's such it's kind of a big subject at the moment and i'm having to delve into every single planet and understand even the mm -hmm. moons around these planets because we've got some fascinating moons like io around jupiter yeah. which is you know it's got hot rock being erupted and it's actually the most volcanically active object in the solar system um so uh, yeah i'm delving into this so a lot of it is the geology of of the earth volcanoes to understand what we know about our unique planet and how that then relates to the planets and planetary bodies around us. So I'm about just over halfway through, got a lot of research still to do, yeah. um, but I'm really enjoying it. I'm learning so much as well. <laughs> it's so fascinating. Well, I look forward to that book because- Thank yeah. you. I mean, you know, especially because it, this is a good time to write it because we've just had the missions to Saturn and Jupiter that have been you know, sent back lovely images at the very least. Exactly, and there's lots upcoming. So I feel like it's going to be a topical subject for, for years to come because we need to explore some of these outer solar system objects in a lot more detail. You know, mm -hmm. there's places like Europa and that could potentially have life, but we, we hopefully have missions that are going to these places um, and we're going to learn an awful lot more about them. And I think they have a lot to tell us. They are fascinating. Well, you know, we had the Voyager missions, which looked at all the outer planets and we learned so much by just flying past them. It was incredible. So um, now that we can start to go and visit individual objects, um, we're going to learn so much more, just like we have with the comets and the asteroids. Oh, wow, it's incredible. Well, we have about a minute left. Is there anything that we forgot to ask you about before uh, we sign off? That oh, goodness, to... that's a good question. I didn't, we probably <laughs> missed loads. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but it's, in the, it's in the book. <laughs> It's in the book. Yeah, I would say read the book, please buy it. And and I always I would urge um, any readers to please send me a review or review on Amazon or or Goodreads or something because I love to hear back from readers because it helps me improve my writing. Um, you know, I'm not you know I've not been taught how to write. It's something I'm learning as I go along, mm -hmm. but I just hope that I can you know excite people with the science along the way. So I want to hear back from people, and I've had good feedback that this book is. 
um, you know, it's good for non-specialists, um, yeah. which mm -hmm. is, is great because that's what I wanted to achieve. So that has been like the best um, feedback I've had, actually, that I really I'm so pleased that it's opened up the subject to people that didn't know an awful lot about it before. So. Right. And I feel like it fills it fills a hole, you know, especially the newer mission. So it's, it's definitely great. You wrote it. So ah, in case you're joining us late, this is uh, the book we're talking about is Catching Stardust by Natalie Starkey. And uh, yeah, just about comets, asteroids, and the birth of the solar system. So interesting. And I learned a lot. And it's been great to talk to you, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. So, yes, indeed. Um, yeah. So, for myself and Jeff, uh, we say goodbye and we'll see you again on Read Science. Bye.